Good evening. How you guys doing tonight? Welcome to Vegas Lights at Calvary Spring Valley. You guys excited for tonight? Praise the Lord. We got an amazing night planned out tonight. I know you guys are going to be blessed. We have Melissa Sese doing some spoken word tonight. We love her. Yeah. We love her here. She's amazing. We've got, uh, uh, excuse me, we've got a couple of guys that are going to be doing some, some artwork over here throughout the whole thing, Robin and Josh, that are going to be doing a bunch of artwork throughout the whole night. So I know you guys are going to be blessed, but let's pray and we'll begin. God, thank you so much for this amazing night, Lord. We're so uh, excited for tonight, Lord, to see how you're going to move, to see what you're going to do tonight. And just pray, God, that you would bless our time together, Lord. We are uh, just so grateful for you and for who you are and for all that you've done for us. We worship you, God. We give you this night in Jesus' name. to a place called Gethsemane. Recall with me the night my very own betrayed me. My heart weary, feet heavy, soul aching with the anticipation of what was to come. Some of you love me, yet deny me, Peter. John and James, sons of Zebedee, are you asleep? The spirit willing yet flesh weak, could you not keep watch with me one hour? As I went to my father in prayer, just a stone throws farther from where you were. Where I fell face down to the ground. The sound of silence so loud, my filial plea for the possibility the hour might pass from me seemed washed out. Abba, may this cup be taken, the cadence of my voice shaken. Replaying the now distant memories of humanity in my mind forsaken. For the sake of my creation, chastened to be chased out of my own nation, left bare. To bear the burial of condemnation, oh how quickly the earth turned into mud as rain poured from my eyes, my pores dripping with sweat like blood, the dirt of my beloved staining my fingertips, my lips. They quiver as I catch a breath, inhaling death. <gasps> Yet exhaling eternity, more earnestly I must pray. As the wind blows, as my tears fall, I seek his face, knowing suffering will come, the time's drawing near. Our Father's will be done. Listen. Listen to the quietness of the olive press as loneliness lingers in the breeze, brokenness hanging sweetly in the trees. Their 
trunks like arteries intertwining so intricately. And the falling leaves and the different shades of green that glitters so vividly. And the fresh fragrance of those olive trees carries with hints of the Mediterranean Sea that fill my nostrils on my knee, Father. Yet not what I will, but you will. Time at a standstill. Yet divinely perpetual prophecies of the faithful fulfilled, yet I am filled full of anguish agony and excruciating sorrow, dreading not death, but of the manner of how it is to be brought to pass, bearing the penalty of the world's sins on my back, each iniquity one lash, his eternal wrath on my bones, the stone the builders rejected, the Savior, Messiah, unexpected. The cure for the infected, dejected, and addicted. Refuge for the afflicted, friend to the neglected freedom. For the restricted truth, for the conflicted, I am. I am God's response to the wicked demonstration of his enduring love for you perfected strengthened by your need for me relieved by your safety comforted by the vision of this mission coming into fruition uplifted by the treasure of our reconciliation. My arms wide open for a slight moment, then embracing you so closely, not knowing where you end or I begin. Your identification hidden in me. My sons, my daughters, this night I will be arrested. Tomorrow I suffer, but forever Together, you and I will live. As the wind blows, as my tears fall, I seek his Knowing suffering will come, time's drawing near. Let our Father's will be done. Oh, this cup holds your sin and filled with your guilt and pain oh this cup poured out for you I'll pay from you I I love you If you have your Bibles, open with me to Luke chapter 22.
where the scripture says this, beginning in verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And as he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Father, thank you for your word tonight. And God, as we read the Holy Scriptures, and as, in a sense, we step onto holy ground, we pray you'd speak to our hearts. God, tonight that there'd be a deeper revelation. God, tonight that there would be a fuller understanding. Tonight, God, that there would be a more profound work of your spirit in our lives as it relates to the suffering of your son. And, and even now, God, we pray that you'd be softening our hearts for the message of the gospel. We love you so much, Father God. And we thank you for Jesus, your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. The disciples had finished their Passover meal. They were in the upper room with Jesus and uh, it had been a long evening for them. It had been an evening, not of just celebration, but also an evening of confusion. They could see in the face of their Lord that something was different. There was grief, there was pain, there was impending agony. For some of them even recognizing and realizing that one of them, one of the twelve, the one of the inner circle, had in fact been preparing the betrayal of Jesus. They had celebrated that Passover meal. Jesus, in fact, had humbled himself, had washed their feet. They sang a psalm, and they made their way through the city, as was their custom, through the Kidron Valley into the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane was a place that was frequented by Jesus and his disciples. In fact, Judas knew that Jesus was ultimately going to be there because this was where he took his disciples regularly. He was in this garden fellowshipping with the Father. He was in this garden spiritually connecting to his heavenly Father. He was in this garden ministering to his disciples on a regular basis. But this evening was different. There was something that was weighing heavy upon their master. And all of the disciples could see it as they entered into the garden. As the story goes... Jesus called three of his disciples, three of his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, to travel with him further, to continue with him in prayer. And as he prayed three times to the Father, successively he went back to his closest disciples and he found them sleeping. His prayer was an interesting prayer as we see it reiterated in all of the Gospels, a unique prayer, one we've never seen him pray before. While he was in the garden, in the midst of his agony, he prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. There was a pressure that was producing agony that led him to prayer. He was praying because of the cup. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever asked yourself the question, what was the cup that Jesus was speaking of? Why was this coming cup that he would drink from, why was it producing such pain in his life? In the Middle East, people would talk of a cup, a cup in a person's life, and it always represented their fate or their destiny. It symbolized what was coming down the road for them. Jesus, when he was speaking of this cup, asking the Father if it was his will to take the cup from him, this cup represented the divine will of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It represented the divine plan of the Godhead. In this cup was our sins. From the beginning, man sinned. In the garden, you remember the story. God had said to Adam, you can eat of every uh, tree 
in the garden, but this one you shall not eat of it, because in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And of course, we know the story. What did Adam do? He and Eve ate. What is sin? Sin is defying the commands of God. As we see the commands of God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven images of me. No lying, no coveting, no lusting, no murder, no hatred in our heart. How bad is sin? Well, the Bible says, the soul that sins shall surely die. God, who is a gust, God, God has just consequences for sin. Body, soul, and spirit experiencing everlasting torment. Sin is like being born with cancer, an incurable cancer that festers until your body, your soul, and your spirit is destroyed. Someone once said this about sin, sin's not bad because it's forbidden, sin is forbidden because it's bad. It's evil, and in fact, it is a big deal to God, even though in our culture it seems that sin is cast in a positive light. It is a big deal to God because God is a holy God. Sin represents everything that God is not. He is a holy God. He is a just God. Because he is just, he must execute justice on every single violation. He sees every single sin. And because he is holy and because he is just, he must execute justice on every single violation against him. David, you remember the story when he'd been convicted of his sin in his heart. Nathan the prophet came to him and with the parable, the Spirit of God revealed to David that David was in sin, had been in sin, had sought to cover his sin, had sought to conceal his sin. For a whole year, he'd been living in secret sin, and the Spirit of God revealed it to him. He'd been deceived in his own mind, thinking that he had escaped the judgment of God, thinking that he had gotten away with something. Maybe God didn't see or others didn't know, but the Spirit of God did. And as the conviction of the Spirit of God came upon him for the murder of Uriah the Hittite and his sin with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, David was convicted so deeply in his heart, he penned Psalm 51, and he made this proclamation to God, against you and you alone have I sinned. God sees every sin. Those sins we perceive as great and those sins that we perceive as small. You're driving down the road and you're passing by a motorcycle cop. He's got his radar out. You're going five miles over the speed limit. Not that this would happen to any of you. You're driving by. You know you're busted five, ten miles over. You look in your rearview mirror. He's not coming after you. Now, why is he not coming after you? Maybe he's busy finishing the last ticket. Uh, maybe he's tired and he doesn't want to come after you. Maybe he just got one of those maple glazed donuts. He's just about to dig into that. <laughs> Whatever the reason may be, you just got to pass for what you're very thankful for. Maybe that was you on the way to church here tonight. Don't raise your hand if that was the case. You just got to pass. Listen, it is not in God's nature to give you a pass. It's not that he doesn't necessarily want to. He can't. It's impossible. He is a just God. Not only won't he give you a pass, he cannot give you a pass. Sin is a big deal. You and I live in a culture, as I said, that, that winks at sin or that sometimes presents sin in a, in a positive light. And sometimes we live with sin so regularly it becomes our new normal so that we can do things that we know are wrong in God's eyes and yet feel no remorse or feel, feel no guilt. We can be in the midst of sin ourselves and we can think that everything's fine and that God's okay with all that we're doing. In that cup was our sins. We're like the passengers on the Titanic. There's a gaping hole that's been ripped in the hull of the boat. The boat is sinking, but the party must go on. In that cup was our sins. In that cup, what we realize is that our sins were placed on him. Our sin is ugly. Sometimes we don't realize or recognize how ugly our sin is 
until we see some abhorrent act. Until we see how a child is abused or a person is raped or there's murder. And then all of a sudden we recognize because of the extent of that sin how ugly sin is. But remember, maybe it is different in our eyes, but it's not in God's eyes. He's a holy God and our sin is ugly. For decades in Manila, there was a landfill for the city of Manila where people would bring out their garbage. Manila has about 12 million people. This landfill was massive. Uh, it literally was a place where 30,000 people or so were living, scavenging plastic to make their living. And I remember the first time I went to Smoky Mountain, the first time I went to Manila's garbage dump. While you were still miles away, you could smell the rotting garbage. And then as we would make our way through this horrid place where people actually were living, where kids were running around naked, urinating, defecating in the road, where kids were suffering with tuberculosis, as we would make our way through, the smell was overwhelming. It was so pungent, it was so intense that when we got back to the mission space, literally our, our clothes, the smell of the place lingered on our clothes. People's rotting garbage, vast tons of people's rotting garbage there in that landfill. That cup that he was speaking of that evening as he was praying to the Father, that cup was our sins placed on him. All of our rotting garbage, all of our rotten sin placed on the Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God that was slain for the sin of the world. The Bible says this, Isaiah is speaking, all we like sheep have gone astray, everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul said it this way. He said he was delivered up to the cross for our offenses. And Peter said this, he himself bore our sin in his body on the tree. That was the cup. The cup was our sins placed on him and he being judged for them instead of us. And this was the cup. It was the judgment of God for every single sin that you and I have ever done. In the cup that he was about to drink, it represented the judgment of God for every single sin that you and I have ever done. Tonight, in your bulletins, there's a piece of paper, and we're going to give you the opportunity tonight to write on that piece of paper one sin or many sins that the Lord Jesus died for, for you in your place. We're going to give you an opportunity tonight to take that and to, to as God leads you, to, to bring that up here and to put those pieces of paper in these cups but this is one piece of paper. This is one piece of paper. Tonight you'll have the opportunity, if God leads you, to write down one sin or some sins as you're praying, as you're seeking the face of God, as you're reflecting on what Jesus Christ did for you, as he stirs you, as he stirred David 3,000 years ago. You have the opportunity tonight to write down, to remember, to recollect, to consider but I want you to think about this. How many pieces of paper would it take if we were going to write down every sinful act? How many pieces of paper would it take if we were to write down every single sinful word? How many pieces of paper would it take if we were to write down every single sinful thought? For some of us, we'd need a lot of paper. But it reminds us of what he did for us when he took the cup. And he was judged in our place. The innocent died for the guilty. The sinless for the sinful. It's the great substitution. And when Jesus took that cup representing our sins that were placed on him for which he would be judged, he took the cup and he drank it to the dregs. He drank it for the least. He drank it for the greatest. He drank it for the youngest. He drank it for the oldest. He knew what was coming. 
He knew as he was looking forward that he would suffer on the cross for you and for me. That it would be while he was hanging on that cross, nailed by three nails, through his wrists and through his feet, that the full weight of God's wrath, the justice, the right justice of God for every single sin ever committed, being committed, or would be committed, laid upon the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. He knew that was coming. He knew it was coming, and it weighed so heavy on him that he prayed to the Father if it was his will to take that cup away. As he was praying, the weight was so heavy on him that literally the the physiology of it began to break down his body. The capillaries in his body began to burst. He began to leach blood through his skin. As the Bible says, he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, hematridosis. The agony of the moment as he was looking towards the cross, the physical suffering, the physical agony, but the soulful agony as the word of God would be separated, the son of God would be separated from, for a moment from the father. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. They knew fellowship, they knew harmony, they knew unity for all of it eter eternity past. And yet in this moment, in some way, it's a sublime mystery we'll never understand. I believe that we'll spend the rest of eternity plumbing its depths, and yet we'll never fully get to the bottom of it. In, in a moment on the cross, the Father laid your sin and my sin on the Son, judged him for it, and turned his face away. So grieved in his heart was Christ that he cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, when he cried to the Father, if it's possible, take this cup, there was silence from heaven because there was no other way. There was no other solution. The Son had to die on the cross for you and for me. And so what did he do? He surrendered. He yielded to the will of the Father. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Tonight, have you realized Tonight, have you recognized? Tonight, have you taken the time to consider the cup? Tonight, have you thought it through, your sin, every single sin? And I mean all of us, but you specifically here tonight. The rotten garbage, the filth of sin in your life, as seen from the eyes of God, was laid upon his perfect son. And Jesus Christ hung in your place on that cross, and he deserved the penalty that you deserved to bear. He hung in your place. There was no other way. And as we consider the Garden of Gethsemane, and as we consider the cross, this is the truth of the matter. Our sin did that to him, which is why God commands Men everywhere to repent. Have you come to that realization? Is the Spirit of God speaking to your heart tonight? Do you recognize ultimately that every single violation of the moral law of God is a sin against Him for which He has every right to ju judge you? But He loved you so much that He delivered up His own Son. Have you come to that realization? Peter did. Peter, when he was fishing in the sea. He was with the Lord Jesus. Jesus said to him, Peter cast out to the deeper water. Peter said to him, Lord, we fished all night. We're fishermen. We fish. You're a rabbi. You teach. He didn't say that part, but I probably was thinking it. Nevertheless, at your command. And so the boat goes out. The nets are dropped. And the Bible says Peter pulled in a catch of fish bigger than he'd ever had before. And as he did that, listen, as he did that, listen closely, as he pulled it in, he, rec he recognized immediately who was in the boat. He fell on his face at the feet of Jesus, 
And he said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. In light of the glory of Jesus Christ, Peter realized how deeply sinful he was. I think about the woman who was forgiven, the notorious woman who had been forgiven of her sins. And you remember her story. Jesus is in the house of Simon the Pharisee. He's been afforded no common courtesy. And as they're about to sit down and have dinner, this woman comes in. She's a notorious woman. She's a sinner. And all the Pharisees know this woman is a sinner. She falls to the feet of Jesus. She begins to weep on his feet. And she wipes the dirt on his feet off with her hair. She anoints him with oil. Why? Because this woman who had sinned so much had been forgiven so much. For you tonight, for me tonight, as we consider the Garden of Gethsemane, as we think about the cup that Christ himself took, the divine plan of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our sins placed on him and he being judged for our sins instead of us. May God remind us tonight that the ground that we walk on is holy, that the love that he has demonstrated for us is unparalleled. There's no love like the love of God. And let me tell you something, there's nothing more powerful than his love. Tonight maybe you're here and and your life is weighed down. You're burdened with sin. I want to tell you this evening, there's forgiveness for you at the cross of Christ. Tonight, maybe you've come into this place and you've flirted with Christianity and you've thought, hey, maybe this is a way I can help myself, a solution to have satisfaction, or maybe the peace I've been pursuing. Listen, yes, it offers that, but first, you have to recognize that you've sinned woefully against God and you need to come to Christ, the lamb that was sla slain in your place. And you need to believe in him and entrust your life to him. Have you taken that step of faith? Have you believed unto everlasting life? Tonight, have you been forgiven of your sins? The power of God is here tonight to bring you that forgiveness. The power of God is here tonight to liberate you from that bondage. The power of God is here tonight to give you a brand new beginning, no matter how dark your sin may be, no matter how desperate your situation is. I want to tell you there's one here tonight. His name is Jesus, and he loves you. He wants to touch you. He wants to heal you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to make you his own. He wants to give you tonight the gift of everlasting life, and it's not your morality it's not your goodness, it's not your religiosity, it's not your commitment to Christian tradition. It is a living relationship with the Father through trust and faith in the Son and what he did on the cross for you. Will you come tonight? Will you, in a sense, acknowledge your sin that was in the cup? And will you receive him tonight as your sav Savior? Let's bow our heads. Father, we love you. So thankful tonight. So thankful tonight, God, for your love for us. Thankful tonight, Lord Jesus, that you took the cup, the filth, the sin, the iniquity of all of humanity, the sheer volume of that Lord, is overwhelming. You took that cup, our sin. You allowed yourself to be clothed in our sin, and you received the judgment and the wrath that we deserve. Tonight, Father, God, thank you for your son. Thank you for the sacrifice that he made for us. Thank you for this love. Tonight, as our eyes are closed, as we're in an attitude of prayer this evening, maybe, maybe you've never acknowledged to God, confessed to God what you know is true. 
There's not one perfect person in this place tonight. The only perfect human being was Jesus Christ. And tonight, God knows the sin in your life. Tonight, you know the sin in your life. And tonight, the Father wants to forgive you. The healer wants to heal you. The divine plan of God is your redemption and restoration. Tonight, will you come? Will you confess tonight? Will you just simply acknowledge? The Spirit of God tonight has been speaking to your heart. He's been convicting you of your sin. Revealing to you that God loved you so much, his own son died in your place. Will you come to him? Will you receive once and for all the love of God, his grace, mercy, and forgiveness? Tonight, tonight if this is you, the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart. You're tired of being burdened down and weighted with sin. You're tired tonight of the guilt and the condemnation. You're tired of the emptiness. Tonight you're exhausted trying to keep your head above moral water, but you can't do it. You need the Lord in your life. Tonight you need His love. Tonight you need to Receive His acceptance just as you are tonight. This is the heart of God for you. No matter what condition you find yourself in tonight, He will receive you if you come to Him by faith. He will receive you just as you are. Will you come to Him? Will you trust in Him? Tonight maybe the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart you know this evening you need the Lord Jesus in your life. You simply want to believe in the gospel. You want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for you on the cross. Tonight, if this is you, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. A prayer that begins your relationship with God. First, I'm going to ask, as our eyes are closed, as our heads are bowed, if God is speaking to your heart tonight, you know you need to take this step of faith. You need to believe tonight. You want to trust in Jesus. You want this issue of sin in your life dealt with once and for all. Tonight, if this is you, what I want you to do this evening, while our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, I want you to raise your hand tonight. Would you lift your hand up high tonight? Acknowledge this evening. You need the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. God bless you over here on my right. God bless you here in the center. God bless you over here on my left. Thank you for raising your hands. I see your hand here in the center. I see your hand in the back on the left. I see your hand over here on the right. Thank you over here on the right, sir, for raising your hand. He loves you guys so much. He loves you. I see your hand over here on my right as well. God bless you. I see your hand here in the center. Listen, tonight, you're not too old. You're not too young. You need to come tonight just as you are as he's speaking to your heart. Thank you here on the left. I see your hand. He loves you all so much. This is his divine appointment for you. He's brought you here tonight for this very purpose. Anybody else, I'd like you to simply raise your hand tonight. I want to see who you are. God bless you. Thank you. I see your hand here. I see your hand here. I see your hand over here. God bless you guys. And take our time right now. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. God is touching your heart right now. Don't turn him away. Don't say no to what he's desiring to do in you. He's got an amazing plan for your life. God bless you. Thank you for raising your hand. If there's anybody else, I just want you to, I want you to raise your hand tonight. You need a brand new beginning. You need Jesus Christ. God bless you. And 
back over here on my left. Thank you for raising your hand. I see your hand over here on my right. God bless you. I see your hand as well. Tonight, maybe you're fearful. You know if you make this decision that there's going to be consequences, maybe in relationships that you honestly shouldn't be in tonight. You've come here and you know that the relationship you're in is not right in the eyes of God. You need to take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. You need to trust him. You need to take this step of faith and believe in him and he will help you deal with all of that other stuff. Tonight, is this you? Would you raise your hand? I want to see who you are tonight. One more thing this evening. If you're a child of God, but you've been prodigal, you're not walking with the Lord, you're off track, you're engrossed in things that you know are sin. God has spoken to your heart tonight. You need to come home. You need to come back to your Heavenly Father. Just as David had to come back, he had to confess and acknowledge his sin against God, tonight your Heavenly Father has spoken to you, Christian, and you need to come home. Is this you tonight? Listen, right where you are tonight, I want to see who you are. I'd like you to raise your hand if this is you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, guys. He loves you. I see your hand here. I see your hand over here on my right. I see your hand over there as well. Bless you, guys. I see your hand. Thank you so much. I see your hand in the back over here on my left. I see your hand, too. Praise the Lord. He loves you, guys. Listen, he loves you right here in the front, sir. Thank you. I see your hands over on my right. He loves you, guys. Listen, he has never taken his eyes off of you. You've never escaped his gaze. And tonight he's, he's reminding you you have a brand new beginning tonight in him. Okay, I'm going to lead you guys in prayer tonight. You can put your hands down. For those of you who've raised your hands, either to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ or to recommit your life to him, I'm going to lead you tonight in a very simple prayer. This prayer is a prayer of repentance. The word repent simply means to acknowledge and confess our sin to God and to turn away from it. This is a prayer of trust and faith. You're going to be believing in the gospel that Jesus Christ did in fact die on the cross for your sins, that he rose again on the third day. And as you make this your prayer to God, he is going to hear and he is going to do great and mighty things in your life. And so tonight, if you raise your hand, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but God is speaking to you as well, I want to lead you in this very simple prayer, and I'd like you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear God, tonight I give you my life. Tonight I confess that I've sinned against you, but I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your son. I believe that he died for me. I believe that he rose on the third day. And I believe that through faith in him, God, you have forgiven me. You've given me the gift of everlasting life. God, you've made me your child. Thank you, Father, for loving me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you guys. It's awesome. Listen, tonight we're going to do something a little different. We're going to have a time of uh, reflection and meditation. And uh, the piece of paper that we gave you guys, what we want to give you the opportunity to do is we're worshiping God together tonight. As the Lord stirs your heart, I'd like you to take that piece of paper. Um, I'd like you to write a sin or some sins on it that you know the Lord Jesus died for you for. And then as God stirs your heart, 
uh, in our time of reflection and meditation and prayer and worship. I'd like you to stand up as God stirs your heart. You can bring those pieces of paper forward and put them in the cups. Didn't these guys do a great job? Father, we love you, God. Thank you so much. All glory, honor, and praise be to your name, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. In the Genesis, he said, light be, fashioning the heavens, earth, land, and the sea. In the Revelation, he invited his bride, saying, come to me. All who are thirsty, offering living water free. Free of the human condition, lofty expectation, social persecution, a chemist confusion. Not hydrogen or oxygen, but blood. Blood shed for the salvation of a nation worthy of condemnation. Now, isn't that a concept? A supernatural love that exceeds worldly possessions, affections, and addictions. Androids and iPhones, credit card bills, tax brackets, and bank loans. Just watch the throne. Not Jay-Z or Kanye. But how God came down from it to become flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone. Here he is, love in his purest state made visible. For the eyes blinded by complacence, tangible for the hands of a doubting Thomas's deliverance, made audible to the ears of the calling of the twelve in benevolence. The impossible made possible for the hearts of a broken world, repentance. The intelligence made irrelevant, foolishness made precedent. Wake up, O oh sleeper! Here is our, as Paul exclaimed to us and the Ephesians, from the fixated slumber, hypnotic days, and stagnant state of mind. The kind when time is sublime, having to rewind to find that single moment at your best. Do you remember that time? The time when enough wasn't enough and my pile of stuff had to be bigger than your pile of stuff. You were at your cusp, your brink of calling life's bluff because you had it all figured out and his love just wasn't enough. Wake up, oh sleeper. Here is our redeemer. From the in-betweens, maybes, doubts, and fears, why so eager? to tread the line between believer and unbeliever. Where sex is a sin and kissing is just a misdemeanor. Where murder, well, is murder. And killing 20 kids is taking it even further. So my vanity Wandering eyes and pride has to be at least ten times better. I mean, look at him. Ooh, look at her. Saddam, Kony, Stalin, and Adolf Hitler. I really can't be that bad of a sinner. Wake up, oh sleeper. Here is our peacekeeper. 
from the self-made excuses developed year after year, being comfortable and setting our minds on things familiar. Your heart on man's ability to whisper sweet anythings in your ear. And your soul, oh, your soul awaits your heart and mind to allow God to take over. Because he is here to wipe away those tears, dispel those doubts and fears, and fill that insatiable void that you've been feeling since you could remember. See, he is that shepherd, leaving the rest of his flock to look for you here. But don't let me make, let me make this clear, because I don't want to get this lost in translation. Salvation is given, not earned because we are deserving, but granted because he loves without condition, pure compassion, seeing us enslaved by indignation, perpetuating cycles of degradation, experiencing himself what it was to be heavily laden. Yet still, he desires our liberation through full dependence on his omniscience, by acquiring patience through circumstances, perseverance through afflictions, building strength through weakness, a father's loving act of discipline. His mercy and grace is sufficient, calling us to be obedient in his mission to take up our cross, our past, future, and our present, and follow the creator who never ceases to amaze, the designer that could not be limited by the Mayans' ending of days, the author and finisher of our faith, the God who humbly came into this world as an innocent, Babe, to eventually endure unfathomable pain that we might receive him and be saved. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us not be caught sleeping because right here, right now, is the time for change.